Greetings knitting neighbors and crafty comrades. Welcome to both returning and new viewers to another episode of Bobolog. My name is Bobby Allen and I am a knitter and fiber crafts explorer in Victoria, Australia. I live with my partner on the lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people and I would like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and future and I would like to extend that respect to all Aboriginal peoples. So to get started, uh, first up is housekeeping. You can find me on other platforms uh, such as Instagram, Ravelry, Kofi where I have a little shop and I think that's it. I feel like there was another one but I think that's it. <laughs> Um, yes, if you do follow me on Instagram, I'm not that great at posting or making reels, but I have um, come very late to the party of stories and I'm making an effort, um, I have been making an effort recently to create story highlights of the things that I'm doing. So I have um, a highlight for specific projects that I'm working on, one of which is the Flared Source Book Pullover, which I will be talking about today, um, and another one that sort of very sporadically gets content is My Natural Dying, which is um, something else that I will be talking about today. So I feel like I should warn you on that note as well that um, this is probably going to be another really long episode. I can't seem to really keep them under an hour and I have a feeling this one is going to go well beyond that. So be warned, um, this is probably going to be a long one, but um, when you started watching this video you probably saw whatever the timestamp ends up being. So yes, we shall see how that goes. All right, um, on to content. The first thing that I want to bring up is uh, a little update on the giveaway. Not really an update because I'm not changing anything. It's more of a reminder that I have my first giveaway going on, which is uh, for reaching or surpassing 100 subscribers here on YouTube. Yay! <laughs> um, that's pretty exciting. It took me a pretty long time to get there but I, I'm so excited to have you all joining me here and um, uh, yeah it's it's great to know that there are people out there who are interested in the content that I put out. I sometimes feel like the tagline for my vlog podcast whatever you want to call it should be knitting TMI, um, knitting too much information because I know sometimes I go into a lot of detail but it seems like uh, a lot of you out there uh, do like the technical things which is great to hear and um, I've loved hearing from um, some of you that you are actually learning something new here and there um, which is kind of something that um, that I'm aiming for or it's something that I've been hoping for and that's the reason why I share so much information because I'm hoping that by sharing all of the little details and all of the processes and thoughts that go through my head um, that you're going to get something out of it as well. So that's been really nice to hear. Um, and just on the giveaway itself, it's been so much fun to see and read all of your comments and responses to it. It's been really interesting to see um, everyone's preferences for um, which, uh, which set of yarn you'd be interested in getting. So if you do want to see um, what the rules I guess are and what is being given away for this giveaway, go back and watch my previous episode which I think um, I didn't realize at the time I was doing my 100 subscriber giveaway on episode 25, which I thought was kind of a, a neat uh, milestone matchup, uh, a quarter of a century um, when I got to a century, something like that. Anyway, blah, 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 blah. Um, yes, if you want to see uh, what is being given away, what the two options are and how to enter, go and watch my previous video. But um, basically I have a wool, option and I have a cotton option 
and I'm letting whoever wins choose which one they get and it's been so interesting to see what everyone's preferences are. Um, sort of one really interesting comment that's come through from a few, few of you is um, that you primarily have worked with one um, but because of that you're really interested in the other and I just think that's so exciting and I would love to be able to introduce um, one of you to a, a new fiber so yeah we'll see how that goes and um, I guess that's all that I have to say about the giveaway it has inspired a new segment that I am calling sincerely curious in craftlandia <laughs> kind of um, a throwback to you know those columns or write-ins or basically you know like sleepless in Seattle you people write in with these the questions or or share their stories or whatever and they sign off um, not with their name but with some sort of alliterative um, what do you call it what do you call it oh that's gonna annoy me now you know when you're pretending not pretending to be someone else you're like is it under a pseudonym is that what I mean but it's not really a pseudonym anyway Sincerely curious in Craftlandia and this question comes from Shari. Shari was asking for um, advice on what cable to pick for making a beanie that just had a, uh, a panel or a single motif um, of cables on the front of it so one that wasn't going all the way around it and that really made me pause for a, a, a while and think about it because I, I don't know, I feel like there are so many different ways that you can approach that problem. The first one that came to my mind is um, if you have any sort of stitch dictionary, you could really just find anything that you liked in there and this obviously doesn't just apply to cables it can apply to any sort of pattern and you can make a panel that is just that. Um, one excellent thing about this particular book the knitted cable source book which is um, a stitch, stitch dictionary for cables is I have mentioned this before but Nora Gorn has a system that she calls the stockinette stitch equivalent the SSE so if you are wanting to um, just put in a panel of cables on the front of your beanie this makes it super easy because if you know what your gauge is for stockinette stitch then um, you can kind of figure out how many stitches around your beanie should be and you should really you should be able to really easily um, sub in one of the cables from this book. You can really, if if it's just a small panel, I mean it's not going to be a huge panel because beanies aren't that huge, but um, if you're just having a panel of it, the pull-in of the cables shouldn't be too great, so you may be able to get away with not uh, increasing or not adding any stitches to that section. Um, I guess it also depends how you want your beanie to fit but um, this is probably in my opinion the best book for figuring out how to make that work for yourself. There is also a beanie pattern in here um, and it didn't occur to me to um, look at that up before. Oh there's one, there's one there but let's see where do they have the patterns all in one section here sorry I should have looked this up oh projects hat page 65 let's see if that's the one that I'm talking about yeah so this I'll do that because I'm not I don't want to give anything away this hat here um if, if you have a pattern with cables and the cables are going all around the hat, you could also just decide to do whatever section of it you wanted in the stitch pattern and do the rest of it in stockinette. That's another thing. Um, one 
hat that I would recommend that has a really nice cable on it is by Oliphant Cat and it is called, oh I'm going to get this wrong again, I should have written this down, I think it's called the Gothic Tracery but if you just look for Oliphant Cat on Ravelry or on her own website uh, I'm sure you'll be able to find it there. It is actually a beanie that has cables um, all the way around it but I did have a look at it um, when I was considering this question and it would be so easy to just pick one panel of the cables and omit the rest and that one I really really like and it is on my um, queue in my queue to do because I think well it looks really good for one thing but I also just really love how the cables work up into the crown of the beanie um, yeah there's I feel like I'm just I'm not really giving you a straight answer Shari so I'm sorry about that but there are really just so many things you can do there are so many different types of cables the other thing that you could even do if you were feeling creative creative enough is to come up with your own cable design and um, this isn't something that I have tried to do myself but I imagine that you could just if you got some graph paper and you know doodled on it you'd be able to figure out you know where cable crossings and that kind of thing should go but um, I don't know how complicated that is I I swear that Norgon had a class on Craftsy many years ago about designing your own cables and it sort of talked about like that I think that was one of the methods um, that was presented but I had a look on Craftsy recently and I couldn't find it or at least I couldn't find that particular class by Nora gone um, so it may have been removed somewhere along the line of all of the changes um, changing of hands that Craftsy has gone through in the last few years but there's probably something out there about designing your own cables just you know doodle on some on some graph paper and see if you can make it work. Um, I feel like I haven't really been of any help but they're sort of the approaches that I would take if I wanted to make um, that kind of beanie. The easiest thing of course is to see if you can find a pattern that you like, like the gothic tracery. Um, but yeah, sorry I feel like I haven't helped but I tried. I hope um, I, I hope you found something there to pique your interest, Shari. Let me know um, what you end up doing. All right, um, let's jump into Handy Dandy. And I have only been working on the one knitting project, and that is the flared source book pullover. So what do I want to talk about first? So in the... Um, where is it? In the previous episode, I had just finished the mammoth um, back piece. So I had shown this here. You can see I've got my pocket on that side, long, long piece, pocket on that side. Um, there is one thing that I had forgotten to mention um, about this beautiful cable pattern that I wanted to and that is just that um, like I mentioned Nora has that stock and stitch equivalent system which I thought was really excellent but you can see in this um, in this cable here this cable pattern here that it starts off like this is actually part this is whoop, this is actually part of the cable pattern so it's like this whole thing let me see if I can get enough of it on the screen but the cable is pretty much you know this narrow bit and expands out into the wider section of cables here so of course the section up here has a lot more cables therefore a lot more pull in than um, this narrow bit here so what I thought was so excellent with her designs I keep saying she's brilliant because she is is that she had really thoughtfully cleverly placed um, increases hidden in amongst all of this cabling so that as you got to do more and more cables you were still having the same stockinet stitch equivalent all the way up so I just thought that was brilliant and I thought that it was worth mentioning um, 
because it's just wonderful. <laughs> so that is one thing. Um, the one big thing that I forgot to mention in the previous episode was my whole big saga of um, doing a nice, a, a smooth rib to cable transition. So if you watch watch if you follow me on instagram then you've probably already seen it in my stories that i had this whole thing where i got to the end of it and i was able to make um this 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 cable bit here transition nicely into the ribbing so where am i here the two um i don't know why i'm struggling so much to show this to you but this here this leg of the cable goes really nicely into the stockinette bit uh, into the knitting stitches of the ribbing and same for this leg that comes out the back so the if i pull this apart you can see there are some um, stitches in between the two legs of the cable and they go into the purl and then it just transitions really nicely the way that i had done the um the start of it when when i just did the ribbing and then transitioned into the design I didn't think about that at all and once I had done the end of it and it was looking really good I was looking at this and one of the legs of this cable was going into a pearl bit and I I just couldn't I couldn't I like I hold knit like knitting I hold knitting in such high esteem and I've been I've done so much to make this pattern my own and to make it exactly what I want it to be that I couldn't let something like that lie and for me because I hold knitting in such high regard I feel like the things that I produce I and this isn't all the time but I personally want to produce things that are really high quality because I want to elevate my knitting as much as I can to sort of help you know, um, uh, <laughs> to, 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 what am I trying to say? Basically, I think knitting is so amazing and my knits need to be good enough to match. Um, I just, I just want them to be the best that they can be. That's basically it in a nutshell. I'll stop trying to expound on that. Anyway, so what I did is I re-knit uh, the ribbing from a, a fresh ball of yarn and then I grafted it onto this without cutting off the original ribbing and then I snipped where the old ribbing was and pulled that off but then I was having all of these like wavy curly loose bits of yarn and I realized I'd completely botched up the the grafting so I undid the Kitchener and I had the two separate pieces like you should have and I grafted them together properly which was a bit fiddly because the uh where the pocket was I think I'm showing you the wrong one I think this was the end and this was the start that I redid yeah you you can see actually that this one this one does the transition a bit better than this one that I had re-grafted but still good enough for me anyway where the 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 way that i had done the pocket is i had sort of knitted it on as i went along so that it was all in one piece and i didn't really need to do any seaming but when i um took off the bottom ribbing the bottom of the pocket was now open so when i was grafting that section where the pocket is i had to do a bit of a it, it felt like I was combining like a three needle bind off with the Kitchener stitch, but so that was really fiddly, but it worked well. Um, you can kind of see that there's like a break there, like there's a line that runs along there that isn't really as visible on this one. 
but I'm still really, really happy with the result. I'm really, really happy that I went to all of that effort to do that because I think it looks so much better than it did. And <laughs> because I had done it wrong the first time, the whole thing um, took me, not including the re-knitting of the ribbing, the whole thing just from, from the initial um, graft to the realizing it was wrong, undoing it, redoing it and getting it all actually done and correct. It like, it took me three and a half hours. And it's one of those things that's like, you're going through it and you're like, Oh my God, this is so much work. Is this worth it? But then, you know, I look at this and I remember what it looked like before and I'm so much happier with this. So for me, it's worth it because I want to produce the best work that I can. And you know, it's these little details that for me are the difference between something that's like really, really good quality and something that's just good quality. You know, I'm, I'm a bit, I feel like my perfectionist obsessive compulsive tendencies have really been heightened with this particular project. And I, I think that really is because I've been doing so many modifications to it to make it my own. But anyway, um, Thankfully, very happily, once I had finished that one and I knit um, the back of it, this bit knit up really quickly. And as you can see, like it is, it's such a small piece compared to, you know, this whole length that I can't even... <laughs> upside down. Let's try upside down. Oh, I could get up off my chair, but I can't be bothered. Hopefully you can see that enough there. So anyway, you can see how huge this whole big giant long panel is and then how small the upper back is in, um, in comparison. That knit up so quickly. I felt like I started it and the next thing I knew it was finished, which was um, quite nice after this slog. So... Um, the special techniques that I use to make this include sloped bind off, which just makes such a nice um, edge there. It doesn't have, you know, the steps that you usually get when you're doing um, just a regular sort of, you know, bind off a few stitches and then the next row you bind off a few more. Um, this, this just makes a really nice edge um, for, um, for seaming and it just looks good anyway I like it to look good interestingly enough it doesn't look quite as clean in garter stitch because you can see um, there's kind of like like this this stitch that is creating the slope it looks like elongated and there's a bit of a hole it's like there's a bit of a hole there and then this one um, yeah they if you can see this clearly enough, the V's are interrupted where the sloped bind off is by this like pearl bumpish type thing. And I guess, you know, that's because it's garter stitch. But, you know, it's not too bad and really like it will be seamed, so you're not going to see it. But I still think um, it's, it's a really easy technique. And again, one of those just little detail things that can help um, improve the piece or something I don't know anyway that's that um, when I did get up to this stockinette stitch bit I did realize that I don't actually know what my gauge is in stockinette stitch so I actually um, swatched and it was kind of like fortuitous that I had taken off the ribbing from the original big panel because I just reused that ribbing yarn that I reclaimed to do my garter stitch swatch and it was kind of like the perfect size to get um, to get a decent swatch there and I just thought I'd mention um, one thing that I did in blocking this is I never really know I'm not really like I, I'm never really confident in how you should swatch garter stitch because it has so much stretch to it and I'm I, I'm I'm just I don't, because I'm trying to get the gauge, I didn't want to stretch it out to match a particular gauge. I kind of just wanted to see what it would naturally do. But 
in a garment, a big sweater like this especially, you're going to have the weight of the, of the jumper like pulling down on it. So what I did, um, and I, I, I don't know, there's, this is kind of just my own technique. I haven't seen anyone else do this and I, I don't know how much it helps really like there's no sort of accuracy or science or math or anything behind this i don't know what the physics involved or anything is but anyway what i'm trying to say is when i pin this to the blocking mat it's pinned exactly i pinned it exactly as you see here so i put a whole bunch of pins along the top of it um so that i would get at least the width um so the width of it would match my stockinette stitch stitch gauge and then I actually just left it like that and set it upright against the wall. And I was kind of hoping that the weight of the water that was in it, because I had wet blocked it, would sort of mimic in a way the weight of a sweater pulling down on it. And I just sort of let, let it hang and let it dry that way. And then I measured my garter stitch row gauge. So. That's the second swatch that I did for this project and um, yeah once I was happy with that then I um, was able to finish the top of this. That's it for the back piece thank goodness it's a huge huge piece so then I was able to get started on the front piece and before I get to talking about that um, I thought I would share I'm trying to pull swatches out from beside me here. Where'd it go? Did I? I pulled them both out. I thought I had only pulled one out. Whoops. Anyway, so these are um, my swatches. This is the original swatch I had done, which I have already showed to you. And I decided to re-swatch this one here. This, this side panel here. Because I did look at it again before I started... Um, or actually after I had started knitting the front piece, I had knit just a tiny bit of getting into the cables. And I thought I would just look at the swatch and just make sure I was happy with my choice. And my choice had been to go with this one here for various reasons that I have explained in previous episodes, so I won't go into it again. But when I looked at this again, I still liked how this looked, but I realized, see how these ones here, they have like a double um, braid Thing before it does the big crossover I realized that this one here was missing that so it's got the double going across the middle of course but going into that there's only a single braid there where over here there's two two one two um, one and Part of the reason that I had picked this particular cable to be the side one is because um, it kind of matched this and all of the, you know, double crossovers that are going on here. So while this still looked really good, I kind of decided that I'd prefer to keep this in it. Um, and the reason that I had tried all of these different versions was because um, basically this chart was a 28 row repeat and this was a 24 row repeat so i was trying to find a way to make this also a 28 row repeat which i didn't like so then i went to make it a 14 row repeat so it would easily divide into 28 like this one anyway so i realized that i wanted to keep the double thing so i tried initially to um to kind of squash those in there but here they're so compacted you can barely see them and again here it just doesn't look quite right um, so I tried the so, so these are my attempts at making it a 14 row cable so they these weren't working so I decided I'd go back and try a different version of making it a 28 row cable which is this one here and it's not bad but it because I put um, extra rows in here and it sort of um, 
So what am I trying to say? Here, those two cables are too close together. Here, I feel like those two cables are too far apart and they aren't matching this one as nicely. So in the end, I decided that I would actually just stuff everywhere. I decided that I would actually just um, stick with the original. You can see I prepared this one. I've covered up the actual charts with some um, cards that I've got so that I'm not giving anything away from this book, but I can show you the original cable. And that's it there. Isn't it so pretty? And like, I think it goes well with this. This is, that's why I had picked it. I think they would complement each other well. And after all of this watching, I realized, you know what? I picked this cable because I like how it looks. I'm just going to stick with it. So I'm sticking with it. Um, whoopsies. All right. So that is that there. Let me put that away. Let me put that away. Let me put that away. So I have actually too many things. I've got too many things. I, I try to like prepare everything around me which means like every available space is like taken up and I don't actually have that much room. So I have the front piece here and I have um, gotten a lot of the way through it because I realized that the deadline for the colors of full knit along um, which is what I'm knitting this for is less than two weeks away. By the time this episode comes out it'll be about a week left to go so I really have to hurry up and, and get moving. Anyway showing you the back of it. So that's what I have done of it there. I'm so happy with how it is looking. Um, yeah, maybe I think you'll see it better if I lay it down here for you. Beautiful cable down the center. Lovely cables down the side. Um, one thing is because I had started the cable before I, um, what am I trying to say? <laughs> so not organized. Because I had just started the cable before I had gone back and realized that I want to stick with the original and not any of my modified versions of it, I had started um, doing it where there was just one braid crossing over into the big one rather than two crossing over into the big one and I decided um, I wouldn't bother ripping out that bit and I would just keep going um, uh, I, I would continue on just from where that was and work the the chart up but then when I started getting into this top bit here where I've started doing the shaping, again you can see the sloped bind off there, um, I, I calculated how many rows this whole thing would actually be and it actually turned out that it ended up, the number of rows ended up being divisible by 24 which is um, the height of this chart. And for a while I was like, I think I was, yeah, I was up to like here, like I said, I was where the armhole was starting. And for a while I was kicking myself going, oh, if I had just all the way back here, just undone the tiny bit, I could have started the cable from the beginning of the actual chart and I would have had complete um, full repeats of the, the cable itself because the way the chart is, it's like that section there that's one repeat of the chart but I had done it so that that oops you can't see that that was one full repeat of the chart so it's not centered and it's a bit awkward if you're looking at it just like that so while I was knitting up this whole bit I was fighting with myself thinking no you do not need to be a complete perfectionist and ladder down all of this um, and re-knit it so just to have the chart centered like that's something that isn't going to make a huge difference to the whole design um, you're not elevating your <laughs> knitwear by redoing that whole section or something like that and I was arguing with myself back and forth like 
no, I want to do it because I want it to be perfect. No, you don't have to do it to make it perfect. It's going to be fine. But then I also realized the way that I had done it is um, the very top, before it gets into the garter stitch, there is one cable that goes in. And if I had stuck with, if I had gone back and done it so that I was working the chart as written from start to finish, it would have ended here. So there on a stockinette stitch section. And I realized I actually really appreciate, and it's, it worked out quite well, that there is a cable at the very, very last row before I do my decreases to do the garter stitch because the cable is pulling in a bit and it's going to make, um, it's just going to help the, the transition into the, the garter stitch, which is many fewer stitches than was used then. <sighs> I can't explain things. I'm trying really, really hard. Cables, pull in. You need more stitches to make them the right width. So you had to decrease a lot of stitches to be able to do the garter stitch. And um, having the cables at the very top, which are pulling it in, um, sort of just helps that a bit, helps make that a bit neater. Oh, goodness. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on from that. The next thing that I wanted to talk about is... Oh yes, um, because I had made all of that effort with the um, back piece to make that one little like ribbing to cable transition nice, I had to do that with this one as well. So in the pattern, um, when you go from the ribbing to the cable, um, Nora just has you do increases um, evenly across so if you can see there there's like a line you can kind of see a line that breaks up the ribbing and the cable um, which sort of helps it not matter um, as much because it's not a smooth transition um, going into going from the ribbing into the cable anyway uh, because there is a break there but because I had made the back of it have the smooth transition, I thought the front of it should match and have that smooth transition as well. So instead of doing my increases evenly across, I actually went through once I finished the ribbing and was like putting stitch markers on all of the spots where I should do um, the increases and I was comparing I was seriously I was like going along it and looking at the chart and being like okay that bits that bit has a stockinette stitch that bit has a pearl that bit has a stockinette stitch okay this one needs to have like a double increase to match yeah anyway I did it and I, I am really, really happy with the result. Like, I think it just looks so good to toot my own horn. Like, just look at that. It's just smooth. It just goes right in, right in, right in. Um, these ones were a bit funny because this was, these were the spots where I had to do increases um, sort of like this, this two panels uh, of knitting becomes like four stockinette stitches to to try to make that a smooth thing and um, thank goodness for a cable being right above there to help that pull in and not be so obvious um, like here you can see it a bit better how it's kind of like bubbled out a bit but I think that looks fine you may notice that there are a couple of spots here like this and here where um, the ribbing does actually go into a purl section but that's actually because that is how the pattern is so if you look further up here where the the chart repeat starts again the whole thing actually just comes out of purls um, it's there's no like this cable does not continue down and this cable does not continue down and it just so happens that down here I was able to have one of them continue down and come up from the ribbing so that actually doesn't bother me 
that those um, couple of or well, three spots there um, don't have that smooth transition because that's just how the pattern is. If I do decide that it does bother me then I can just easily um, pretty easily um, fudge fixing that with some duplicate stitch. So that's that there. Um, the other thing that I want to mention is I tried a new increase. So um, I'm going to pull that up so that you can see. So this one um, isn't the new one. This one's a make left and then I tried a make right and then these two here, I hope that you can see that well enough, but that is a um, new increase that I discovered um, by Asia Brill. I'm so sorry if I have pronounced, pronounced that wrong. I will have the link for the technique down in my... Um, <sighs> down in my YouTube description below and I've just realized that that is what I forgot to say in my housekeeping is that I have all of the links to everything I talk about down in the description below. Um, I also have a website where I have transcripts and I have all of those links and yeah so you will find um, the technique for this twin crease um, down below but if you can not sure how well you'll be able to see it there but it's like so there's this row of um, this column I should say of stockinette of knitting and then the two two stitch the stitches it becomes two columns one column becomes two columns but they're centered around um, that column instead of leaning left or leaning right it's leaning both ways at once which I thought was really neat so that's really cool um, I think that's a really neat decrease I did try using that day that it's an increase not a decrease um, I did try using that increase um, all the way along here when I was doing the increases for the cable but I did find that I had to um, fix them I had to to rework them um, in this one here because to have two twin creases side by side was actually making a little hole so instead um, for these ones I ended up laddering down a couple of, of rows just to make them um, uh, make one left and right increases instead so I thought that was a really cool new technique to learn what is next next is I'm just looking at my notes talked about ripped to cable talked about the tink twin crease talked about re-swatching the side cable um, oh yeah so there's two more things that I wanted to say about this front piece here so one is um, this big cable that's in the middle here is um, a fairly big chart um, I don't have a great memory um, I have a pretty terrible memory so there was no way I was going to be able to memorize um, this chart but I really like logic and I really like puzzles and I quite enjoy math and I feel like this chart was just ticking it was just satisfying all of that for me because while I could definitely not memorize the chart each row was just so easy because it was just so logical and sequential and it just like it was just really satisfying. I found it so satisfying. So basically what it was is if you're looking at the row, each row on its own and just looking at the knits and the purls, each row was like a really easy pattern. It was either like, um, let's see what one of them, one of the rows was like, eight six four two eight six four two eight six four two and then another one of the rows was two 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 four two 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 four two 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 four and another one of the rows was four four six six four four six six four four six six so I really enjoyed that about it I could not memorize the chart but like when I was got up to the next row that I was working I just looked at the chart and I was like okay what's the pattern for this chart and I wouldn't need to look at it as I was working all the way across I would just be going in my head two two four four what not 
two 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 four two 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 four or whatever it was um and I just found that so enjoyable and so much fun so that was excellent the other thing is if I try to um, stretch this out here you will see that um, the front piece itself actually um, it's actually this shape what's this shape it's like a V so rather than having rather than being like bigger around the hips and then narrowing as you go up into the waist it's like the narrowest point is the hip and then it increases up and um you know that's shown in the schematic and everything that it has that shape it's kind of like a reverse a line and for a while i was like oh that's that's a bit odd because usually um i mean in my <laughs> experience shaping for a sweater um if it's going all the way down to your hips it will either be straight or it will go a bit wider where your hips are because generally speaking your hips are wider than your waist it could also do like an hourglass thing if it's a really shaped thing so wider at the hips narrower at the waist and then wider again for the bust um, and this kind of shape where it's like a V I have personally only sort of seen it where it's a cropped sweater so it's um, hugging you around your waist and then it increases to um, accommodate your bust so for a while I was thinking that's really interesting like it's just an interesting shape and it doesn't look like it pulls in and then I had like my dumb moment of realization or my realization of seeing that I was being dumb in the way that I was thinking about it but of course it's the flared pullover it's got that huge long back panel that connects to the front and um, because because um, it's wider at the top and then narrower at the front that helps the the ends of the flare bit like pull in around the front and not just be hanging and bunching all the way up the back it'll actually like come around a little bit so of course it was just like just another moment of like well yeah this is why nor is so brilliant the only thing that I want to say about this pattern is um, it only comes in seven sizes which is okay um, it's it's not bad but it's not the best either it's not the most size inclusive pattern so I think it, it goes from I've got it in my notes actually the bus circumference um, the range is from 76 centimeters to 137 centimeters so it could be better and I feel like for a pattern like this as well, where, you know, the it's not all over cables. It's like you have your panel, which didn't change for any of the sizes. And then you have all of this stockinette stitch where all of the shaping and all of the extra sizing could happen. I feel like it just, it would have been really easy to make it more size inclusive. Um, but I, I actually haven't checked the other patterns in the book, but I assume that she's done it so that they are all seven sizes. Um, but yeah, I just thought I'd mention that there for anyone who is um, considering um, getting this book or making this pattern. Um, yeah, just keep in mind that if you are smaller or larger than, than either of those, then you might have to do a bit of work to make it work for you, unfortunately. But um, yeah I mean it's not terrible old patterns used to just come in one size but we've come a long way since then so yes all right I think that is all that I have to say about the flared um, cable source book pullover what's it called flared source book pullover flared pullover yes I think I'm done with that I'm going to put this away okay do 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 can't put things anywhere um, all right so um, I have for the rest of the episode this is what I have to share I'm gonna have three multi crafty things to share with you um, which will hopefully be short but we shall see I have another um, eyes and ears and of course my heart full of craft um, which seems to be 
um, not popular, but people appreciate that segment, which is really nice to hear. Um, yeah. Um, okay. But before I talk about all of those other things, I did just want to have a bit of a rant. Um, well, we'll see how much of a rant it turns into. Um, but basically, I found an article um, that was written earlier this year that was talking about knitting. Its focus was actually something else. But the thing that I want to, to talk about is how it was talking about knitting as a hobby because that, like, really got my goat. Like, it really... So this thing, this knitting thing, right, like... I like it. Can you tell? Like, I kind of like it. I kind of love it. I'm kind of obsessed with it. It's my thing. <laughs> so basically, this article wasn't um, talking about knitting as a hobby that favorably, and it really bothered me how it was talking about it. And ultimately, it it the purpose of the article was to to be like um basically here's a way to like get into knitting and but it's kind of like how can you like be saying all these like sort of negative things about knitting talking about how you know daggy and boring and unappealing essentially it is and then be like but really you know it's fun whatever else the article was talking about and I actually shared this article with some um, with a group of knitting friends online, and we had a really interesting like chat um, just about all of the the nuances of it and everything. But yeah, I was just really offended. Um, I am a defensive person <laughs> in general, so um, yeah, I love knitting. So they were kind of insulting knitting in a sort of like passive aggressive, not passive aggressive, but like. Yeah, they they just weren't talking about it that favorably. So naturally, I got really defensive about it. <laughs> and anyway, knitting is not boring. It is not daggy. It is not, <laughs> it is not unappealing. I mean, clearly I am like so deep in this world of knitting that I like I cannot see outside of it. <laughs> um so I have a very different perspective from obviously the journalist and what have you. So I, I, I can understand that. And I understand that, you know, people have different experiences and I don't want to, um, like, if someone's experience truly was that they tried knitting and um, they liked knitting, but they couldn't find anything that they thought was appealing. I'm like, okay, I can understand that that may be the case for you. But I, part of me is also very much like, where did you look for patterns? Like, how, how hard did you look for patterns to, that, that you couldn't find anything interesting? Because, I mean, the internet and just going to a yarn store like even just going to spotlight or Linkraft, it's like a riot of color in the yarn section so like one of the things that they'd said was like that it was all in neutrals and for one thing like neutrals are beautiful neutral colors are like they they're so beautiful and they're timeless and they're classic i get it if that's not your thing i mean look at me you know knitting bright yellow <laughs> but Okay, neutrals are beautiful, but also you, like, how can you, like, go looking for yarn and not see colour? And I don't know, maybe they were just referring to patterns, like all of the patterns that they were seeing that were just in neutral colours, but then it's also, like, just substitute, like, just change, choose a fun coloured yarn if that's what you're after. And, oh, like, I was just, like, in my head, like, thinking about... <sighs> All right. Yeah. So I really like knitting. Why do I like knitting? I like I like the history. I like the technicality. I like the versatility. I like yarn is just 
beautiful and it's like it like feels really good in your hands it's so I guess you know I guess you'd call that tactility and texture and just so many things and then you know I like I was just going off on so many tangents in my head one of which was like oh my gosh how can you think knitting is appealing do you know who brought knitting into like the world of fashion in western culture like Coco Chanel like she has a lot to do with knitting moving out of the realms of like sports well sports well sportswear <laughs> and utility and becoming like a fashion item like like whatever you might think about coco chanel's designs or her brand or whatever like she's an icon of fashion how can you say that that is unappealing and then i have to check myself because it's like well they're talking about knitting not knitwear they can be two very different things so you know pull it back bobby um, and just yeah i just got i just got defensive because i really like this thing and um yeah i guess i was kind of sad that someone would think that because there's so much out there there's so there's so much out there there's it's actually like almost a problem like <laughs> that there's too much out there you know um as a ravelry user especially like if i want to look for something new which I really have no, no need to do because I think I have over 200 patterns in my Ravelry queue. But, <laughs> like, I have to use, like, every single filter possible to just not have a million pages to browse through because there is so much out there. There is so much to choose from. And, yeah, yeah. I just did not like how this article was talking about knitting because I love knitting so much, <laughs> basically. Um, so this is kind of my love letter to, to knitting. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's just, it's been around for so long. And even when, you know, knitting was considered just to be utilitarian or for sportswear um, and not fashionable or something, that still doesn't mean that people weren't making beautiful clothing beautiful pieces out of knitting like they definitely were there were like people were knitting like gorgeous rugs people were knitting gorgeous like garments and sweaters like think about feral think about you know shetland lace or orenburg shawls or just so much and like the things some of the things that those ancient knitters could do um I've unfortunately never been to a museum that has shown knitwear, but I have heard tell of like people going to museums and seeing this ancient knitting and like, you know, these things are knit at gauges that like, I could not even fathom knitting at. Like they're just so tiny and so fine and so detailed and like how, like, oh my goodness. Okay. I think I need to move on because I'm just, I love, oh. You, you know I love knitting. I don't need to tell you that I love knitting. You know that I love knitting because you're here listening to me talk about knitting every episode. So anyway, I'll move on from that. Let's get into some multi-crafty, shall we? So like I mentioned before, I have three things to talk about in multi-crafty. Let me go through, um, I'll try to go through the quickest first. Um, so the first one is spinning. And all I wanted to show you is that I recently filled my first bobbin from my electric eel wheel 6, my AEW 6, and this holds so much. It holds so much yarn, seriously. Like, there is about, um, there's about 300 grams-ish of this yarn that you can see, and I have tried to fin it spin it I have tried to spin it as fine as I possibly can and there is actually more than 300 grams on this bobbin because um, 
I actually used this bobbin when I was first getting to know my wheel. So I have a video on my channel that is my introduction to this spinning wheel and you'll be you can see in that one that I play some wheel games to get to know my wheel and a lot of that involved um, spinning waste yarn and just feeding it onto a bobbin. So underneath all of this um, yarn that you can see is waste yarn. So you can fit, you can comfortably fit, or I could comfortably fit more than 300 grams of yarn onto this, which is um, pretty amazing in my opinion. So that is number one done. The second thing that I want to share is a sewing. It has been, I can't even remember the last time I had a sewing thing to share with you, but I made this thingamabob here, which is an interchangeable needle case. It is not very well made, um, but it is plenty good enough for my standards and for my purpose. This um, print here, to me it looks like marbles, but I had to buy it because the quilting store that was selling it called the print yarn balls. So I had to, even though to me it doesn't look like yarn balls at all and it looks like marbles. But anyway, at the start of this year, sometime at the start of this year, I saw um, a sewing pattern thing for making accordion pouches. And I thought at the time that that would be perfect for um, interchangeable needles or even just keeping like a whole bunch of circular needles. So I've had on my list for ages to make one for myself. And um, the sewing mojo finally got me a couple of weeks ago and I, I made it, I made one. And I didn't do, I didn't make the pattern exactly um, as, um, I, I didn't follow the pattern exactly because I customized it to make it the perfect sewing thing for me. So um, let me show you what that is. So first of all, I haven't put um, like a, bu uh, a button or any kind of closure, closure thing here because right now it's this narrow. But if I ever take this traveling with me or anything, then I'm going to need to be, you know, filling it up with more things and then where this flap comes down to is going to change and it won't stretch as far so I didn't want to put a closure so that's one thing there um, the other thing is let me open it up um, so that's like the accordion thing there and the pattern itself had this first flap as a closed like pocket on its own as well but I wanted to be able to um, open it up so that I could see all of my needles so that was another of the changes that I made is I made this first flap I made this first flap um, be able to open up flat and of course something just fell out of it what could have fallen out oh Something fell. One of the needles fell. This one. This one fell out. Whoops. Anyway, be careful, Bob. <sighs> what was I saying? Fold out and um, have the pockets for all of these. So there's an extra row of stitching there to make these not as deep for all of these, but I have left a couple of longer ones on the sides so that I can fit. Um, longer things if I need to and then also this um, so each one has like the big pocket but then where you combine each pocket together it has like a mini little pocket so the first of those mini little pockets for me I um, just made into more um, needle sized little pockets so that I could put in um, any extra needle tips that I may buy like this lantern moon one here that can that can fit into there and then I have um, some of the bigger cables in the bigger pockets and then smaller cables in the smaller pockets which I made um, a lot bigger than what the pattern had said as well so that they aren't getting really um, compressed in there and then 
So that's my interchangeable um, cables. I think I've got yep, interchangeable in there as well and in there as well. This one's actually a dud cable. I keep a clip around it so that when I pull it out I re can remember that it's a dud one. Um, and then in these other three um, big cables here I have my likeys, my likey circulars. So each of these has two. So I think um, this pocket might have um, the ones that basically they're in size order so probably 2 millimeter, 2.25, 2.5, 2.75, 3, 3.25. I think that's what I've got of the likeys and then yeah just more cables in there and I'm so I'm so happy with it. It's like exactly what I needed. Um, it's exactly like the right size and everything to fit my things. I wanted to make it um, as big as possible so that um, the cables can be as open as possible and, and not like kink up um, so much. And the other thing that I'm super happy with as well is um, I had bought the remainder that they had of this fabric and I can't remember what size it was but the way that I was able to do this is the size of the pouch itself was dictated by the size of the fabric that I had so I divided it up in such a way that I I barely had any scraps I should have pulled them out they're in a bag somewhere with all of my fabric scraps that I use for stuffing but I had next to nothing I had next to no like yeah, no, I had next to no waste on this, which made me so happy because I, I kind of hate waste um, for obvious reasons. But even so, so how many pockets do I have here? One, two, three. F I have four of the big pockets and they're all the same size. So I think I was able to see like, so say the fabric is... I really should come more prepared for you. I feel like I like do all of this prep and then when I come to sit down and talk to you it's like well you didn't really think about everything did you? No. Anyway say this is the size of the fabric so along one length of it I figured out like what's the longest I could get three of those pocket sizes and then I put a fourth one um, on the other half of it and then the this bit everything's falling out whoopsies I'll talk about that in a sec um, anyway uh, this bit of it needed a longer bit of fabric because it has the flap that goes around so I um, had so the same size one two three four and then a longer bit and then this bit here I just cut in half and that is what made these two bits here so seriously like really minimal waste and that like you know that worked out to be like a good size for like fitting the my longer needles and then I was just able to adjust it as much as I you know like do this extra stitching that I needed to fit my shorter cables and like it just it just worked out so well the one thing that I hadn't considered is that um, things fall out of it so <laughs> I will need to um, just putting stuff away I will oh, I don't know what I'm gonna do about these ones falling out because clearly I just didn't make um, sorry that was off camera I these had come out and I was just putting them back in I clearly just should have made these pockets just a little bit narrower so that they could hold they're um, a bit nicer so I might have to do elastic or something somewhere I'm not sure um, but the bigger problem is the cables all falling out of here I think what I'm gonna have to do um, is just buy some stick on velcro and put it there which isn't going to be the nicest but it'll be the easiest to attach now that it's all sewn up so um, yeah I'm so I'm so pleased with this and Oh, you can see things are falling out. These ones came out again. I, yeah, I need to come up with a solution for this. Maybe for now they can just live together. Yeah, that's better. Um, and, oh, okay. I'm not gonna, I'll, I'll fix this off camera.
I'll fix this when I'm done. Um, put that aside. Okay, and then the last multi-crafty thing that I want to share with you is I have done some more natural dyeing. Oh. <laughs> um, quite a bit, quite a bit as you can see here. So um, I, I'll take you through all of these. Um, so the, ooh, that's kind of fun to have them all there. So these are my originals. These are um, Polworth yarns from Tandy, from Tand One Coot. So um, that's their natural, oh, I can't remember if that one has a name, their cream, and that's their top, their natural top. Um, so that is how I got all of these other colors here. So I'll start off with what we did in the dye group, and that is... Um, we dyed gardenia with gardenia last month. So that is these two colors here. So these beautiful blues, which I would not have expected from that plant. So amazing, so impressive. Um, it, they're just beautiful. I love this um, natural, um, this natural top. Yeah, top, this natural top in particular. It's such a beautiful, deep, color um yeah the the bright like the blue it's a nice blue um but like a, a really nice sky tur blue turquoisey sort of blue and while i love blues it's not really my kind of blue but i do still really like it and i'm so impressed that that has come out of that plant so that is what we did in the dye group and then at home on my own, I thought I would try doing some modifications. So the first thing that I did is I got some wattle. Um, so I should say in the group we dyed five mini skeins. So I had three over the cream and two over the top. So with another one of the creams and the tops that were dyed in this gardenia, I over dyed them with some wattle um, that I just got from along the bike path. So that is that there. Um, yeah, and it came up, they came, they turned into these lovely greens. And you can kind of see um, where that, uh, where the yellow didn't really take on this one here. You can still see some of the blue, um, the original blue color. Oh, that's a big one there. Um, you can still see it in there. Um, yeah, so that's those ones. And then the last thing that I did with my final um, gardenia on the cream is to... I, I, I found a eucalyptus gunny and I had tried dyeing with it previously and I got like a really bright, almost reddish color. So I was wondering or I was hoping that if I dyed something that was like an orangey reddy color it wouldn't it would give me something purplish um, and because it was like an orange red so there's more yellow in it I wasn't expecting it to be purple purple but yeah I was kind of just hoping I'd get something purplish and that did not work it um, it did this <laughs> So, I, I don't know why. It's like got some rust. Oh, I should say I did put vinegar in with this one as well because in my experiments with dyeing with the gunny, without vinegar it was just going yellow, but with the vinegar it was getting the orangey reds. I think um, I probably should have put more vinegar in this because I really didn't put that much. Um, so some of it went green, and some of it went orange um, so the blue had like n pretty much no effect or almost no effect on um, on the orange bit no idea why um, in that same jar I did just put um, a cream that hadn't been dyed with anything previously so you can kind of see what that looks like on its own here and again you've got you know some bits of yellow and um, a lot of the orange so it's kind of interesting how this one has done that it I think it would be because um, I had 
all like I the the jar that they were in was quite full of leaves so I think maybe all of the bits where it was yellow maybe that was where the yarn was sitting up against a leaf and maybe it wasn't getting like vinegar or I don't know who knows I mean like the it's the it's really interesting how they've come out basically so that's those ones there and then again on my own um, I just did some more experimenting with some various um, Aussie botanicals that I found so what do I want to do let's put this one aside for a sec this one is what's this one this one is I did look at what everything was before I started filming and I thought I'd remember but oh this is let's start with what I know shall we this one which is sort of like a really earthy yellow that's got um, a bit of brown through it that and some of the like some of the brown bits I don't know if you can see but they sort of like have a reddish tinge to it really really subtle that is um, the flowers of the slender western rosemary which is a, a light purple flower that's that one there um, move aside for a sec that's that one there this one which um, is a slightly greenish yellow is from the Coria and again I do think if I none of these had um, vinegar I do think um, if I try this one again with vinegar um, I'm hoping it will give me a greener result so I'll try that at some point and then these two are Oh my gosh, why can't I remember? I'm pretty sure this one is the Grevillea flower, which is red, um, a red flower. So I was hoping for a stronger color, but no luck there. This one, oh, I know. This one is, um, I suspect it is Geraldton wax. Um, and if you look at it on its own, it doesn't look like it took any color, but if you compare it to, um, the 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 natural color you can see that it it did it did darken it a little bit but you almost really can't tell so yeah there was one other that I had tried which was um cones from the she oak but they did absolutely nothing nothing at all so um I, I don't have them here to show you because there's nothing to show so um, yeah so that's those ones there the other one that I wanted to show from that lot was um, is goldenrod which came out with this beautiful buttery yellow and because that one did so well um, I also tried it on the top and I find the top one really interesting because when I look at that on its own I feel like um, I feel like I can't really tell that anything has happened to it but then when I compare it to the original um, I can see the difference um, I can see like the yellow on there so yeah that's just been some fun playful um, experimenting on my own um, yeah so just to show you those are my tops I don't know what the best way to show you all of these are. So they're my tops. I really like those. And then, yeah, just all the other. We lost one. <laughs> Let me put that down. <laughs> okay, that's it. I'm calling it there. That's it for Multicrafty. <laughs> eyes and ears. Eyes and ears. I want to share that I have been watching um, Lovebird Lane. So I'm doing my usual thing of watching from the very, very beginning when she was called My Mudlings. Um, and then it's really fun. You get to see her start her business um, dyeing yarns and you, you get to see her like you know experimenting playing around with dyeing and growing her business so that's really that's really good i am still like uh, i don't know how far along 
I haven't paid attention to like episode numbers and stuff. I don't know what episode number she's on at the moment, but I'm still somewhere in the 40s, I think. So I still have quite a long way to go. I'm still a few years behind. Um, but that's been really like great to watch. She's really sort of casual and honest. I love that like in her early episodes before she moves house, she's just sitting on the floor in front of her couch. Like it's just so casual and relaxed and and yeah, she's just like talking to you um, and, and she's like really open and honest and, and that's really lovely for, you know, like she just shares, she's she's sharing like her life with you and it's just really nice. So um, go check out Lovebird Lane, which is Julianne, um, who has the business, Lovebird Lane. Um, yes, I like, she... Like I said, she shares a bit about her life and I'm always really impressed when people do that because that's something that I, I, I've done that here and there in previous episodes, but I don't really like tell stories about what's been going on with me or talk really about like what's going on in my life outside of this knitting world because like for me, probably the main reason for that is I feel like I talk so much about knitting that there's just no more time like this episode has gone quite long already and I really should be wrapping things up and I, I swear I'm getting to that but like I feel like after I've talked all about the knitting I have taken up way more than enough of your time <laughs> and and there's no time left for me to like share life stories with you but then the other side of that is also I just don't think that I am like I, I'm not good at telling stories and if I think about for example what have I done this last fortnight I can't think of a story to tell you like I just like I don't know I don't know what I've done I don't have any like interesting like anecdotes um and I feel like yeah it's like yeah, I don't know. I feel like interesting things don't happen to me or something. Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like I feel like I should start like a, a daily journal or something and try to like tell a story about my day to get used to telling stories or making stories out of my life because I'm just like, I, I, I don't know. I did nothing fun. The only interesting thing that I do, in my opinion, is knit. So <laughs> that's, I already share that with you. Anyway, um, yeah, I really like that, you know, among all of the crafting things that Julianne shares on Love Bread Lane, it's like she does share um, things that have been going on in her life. I do also want to say um, she knits and crochets and spins and dyes, and she did also do um, some polymer clay for a while there. Um, so yeah, it's really fun to see all of the things. All right. Yes. Okay. Last thing, last thing I promise, and that is Heartful of Craft. And this is going to just seem like a, a product placement plug type thing because it kind of is. But honestly, I just really love them. Um, and so my Heartful of Craft is, this feels really weird for me to say, but I'm really grateful for shoes. <laughs> Oh, uh, but look at them. They're so pretty. Aren't they so pretty? Like, they're my color. They're so my color. And these, okay, start from the beginning. These are Allbirds. And I have known about this company for a few years now, at least a couple of years now. And my partner has bought their shoes before. He's actually bought their shoes that are made out of eucalyptus. But I have... These are the first pair that I've ever bought of theirs and I got it only just recently and the reason that it took me so long to um, buy them is because I was waiting for like a colour that I was really, really, really in love with. So they're always coming out with new colours and they're always really fun and all of that kind of thing but like, oh, it's, it's also because I had runners before and I was kind of waiting for them to wear out because I don't need two pairs of runners. Um, anyway, um, they came out with this color recently, which they're calling emerald green, and it is just so me. It is just so my, like, ideal number one color. Like, I just love it. So I finally got myself a pair, and my old runners did wear out. 
maybe like a year ago, but I was waiting. I clearly was waiting for this color to come out. And they're so comfy. They're made of wool. Did I say they're made of wool? This is why I really like them. This is why I've been following this company, because <laughs> they're made of wool. Um, they're super comfy. Um, I do have to say um, they only have whole si sizes. They don't have half sizes. And they recommend if you have wide feet like I do to um, size up. Looking at the sizes, I feel like I maybe would have been a size 4, but they don't have a size 4. And I figured because if I think I would have been a size 4, my sizing up would have been to get a size 5, which is their smallest size. I have really small feet. Um, <laughs> so I got the size 5, but that was actually still too narrow for me. So I ended up returning those, um, getting the full refund, and um, I got the size 6, um, and that fits me really, really well. So I'm so happy to have my shoes. Um, a couple of more things that I'll just mention about them. One is that the laces are really, really short. Like, I can just barely get, like, a comfortable bow out of this. So usually what I end up doing is um, I just do like a knot or a double knot and I stick like I just pull the ends through that bit there so that they hold um, yeah and the knots don't come undone or whatever but that's one thing their laces are just like oddly really short and the other thing is kind of just like yeah, so I'm a knitter, right, and I really like wool, right, and I know a little bit about wool, especially since I've started spinning. Um, I feel like I have a bit of an understanding about how wool works and different sheep breeds and stuff, and I get that, especially in, like, fashion and in, you know, the wider public that doesn't knit and doesn't craft and, like, doesn't work with wool, like, merino is kind of like the thing. It's, like, the only thing. It's like the best wool and all of that. Um, so these are made of merino, but knowing what I know, I'm just like, that just doesn't make sense to me. Like it's a shoe. It's got to be like hard wearing. You can see like, oh, maybe you can't, but it, like it has already started peeling a little bit inside. Um, and to me, it's just like, that is not the best wool choice, but whatever, you know people want merino, give the people what they want. Um, and the last thing that I want to say about the shoe isn't really the shoe, but it's kind of just reinforcing how much this is my color because, I mean, it's not an exact match, but look how well it goes with this yarn that um, I got from Tarn Von Poot earlier this year. So this was um, a, a hand dyed. I'd, I'd kind of sort of requested this, um, this hand dyed color from them. And yes, yeah, they're, this is a bit green. To me, this is a bit greener than the shoe, but it's my color. My color makes me so happy. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm grateful for shoes, which still just sounds so weird to say, but I love them. And they are actually like the first shoes I feel like I've ever worn that people have actually commented on. There have been two occasions now where I've been out and people have asked me like where I got my shoes and what brand they are and can I send them like the brand so that they don't forget. So that's really exciting. All birds. Grateful for all birds. Um, yeah, and that's all I have to say. Um, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for sticking around um, throughout this whole long episode um extra long longer than usual episode and um i need to go and have some lunch so i really need to stop chattering on and on and on at you um thank you for joining me um thank you to oh yes of course um hello of course to all of my viewers um especially to well not especially i don't like saying that i don't know why i always say that focus bobby okay hello to everyone thank you for joining me um i have had a lot of new um subscribers recently and i'm sure part of that is to do with me doing a giveaway but i hope that you're here because you like what i have to say um but 
I know that a lot of you have come over from um, Kooky Knits, which is Ira, or Sarah of the Maker's Corner, um, the, which she has the Tailor Made podcast. I just um, forgot for a second whether she rebranded the Tailor Made podcast to also be called the Maker's Corner. Anyway, both of them gave me such beautiful shout outs recently, and I know that a few of you have told me in the comments that you've um, you've come over from watching um, from seeing what either of them recommended me. I can't speak. Um, so thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Ira. And thank you to all of you who have given me a chance based on their recommendation. Um, like I said, I, I'd been feeling like um, my tagline should be knitting too much information because sometimes I do, I go into all of this detail that I go into and I am editing it and I think like, does anyone, is anyone actually interested in knowing like this much detail like I am I like hearing other people go into that much detail but like does anyone else really like is it too much um but both of them sort of mentioned like how technical I am and um they said it in a positive way <laughs> so um yeah that was really nice I'm very happy to be known as the technical knitter um it is not all the time um it, it really yeah anyway i've said it all before i'm not going to repeat myself um thank you everyone thank you all for joining me thank you for watching thank you for being here um yes thank you <laughs> um one last thing that i wanted to say in my housekeeping as well but i completely forgot is patricia of kamai um the the kamai vlog the knitting vlog called Kamai. Why do I have to say things in a million different ways? Why can't I just say them? Patricia from Kamai has set up an Australian knitters group on Discord. Any um, knitter is welcome to join. Um, if you are on Discord or if you're happy to give that new, um, well, I shouldn't say new, new Discord's been around for a while anyway. If you want to join that community, I have a link for it below. Um, yes, it's there's a lot going on in that community. Discord is something that I'm still getting used to. I fall behind a lot in the chatter just because I forget to look at it. But there's like they have a sewing room um, and a spinning room and a crocheting room and a weaving room and like you know general chatter and like threads for knit alongs and events and like yeah it's 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 been really great i'm just getting used to keeping up with it and checking it um but if you're interested in joining that if you're an australian crafter and you um want to join that community check out the link below okay and i am actually signing off now um thank you for the millionth time thank you um i hope you take care stay safe love laugh be curious be crafty and i'll see you soon fairly well